All right. Good morning. Welcome to the fourth and final day of the Eighth International Focused Ultrasound Symposium. Um, really glad you guys all can join us this morning. We have uh, an exciting couple of uh, special lectures planned for uh, this morning before getting into some of our uh, additional scientific programming. So first up, we have uh, Dr. Brian Lang, who is a clinical professor in the Department of Surgery at the University of Hong Kong and chief of the Division of Endocrine Surgery at Queen Mary Hospital in Hong Kong. Over the past seven years, Professor Lang and his team have treated more than 600 patients using focused ultrasound, primarily for benign thyroid nodules. And because of his vast experience and expertise, Queen Mary Hospital and its associated sites in Hong Kong have become one of the most active areas today using Thoracleon's Echo Pulse device. He has received two competitive research grants recognizing his work with HIFU for Graves' disease and multinodular goiter from the Health and Medical Research Fund. His work is extremely fascinating, and it's my hope that in listening to his talk, the audience will be inspired to bring more attention and awareness of this treatment modality to their own institutions. After his uh, pre-recorded talk, there will be a 10-minute Q&A session with Dr. Lang, who will be joining us live from Hong Kong. So please listen in and try to um, think of some questions for him. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, today to present my, uh, the topic of ultrasound-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound ablation for B9 fire nodule. It's a pleasure to be on the 8th International Symposium for the uh, FUS uh, this year. Uh, so a little bit of background about fire nodule. Fire nodule is a common medical condition. Uh, some of these nodules can grow and cause pressure symptoms and cosmetic concerns. And the treatment, the standard of treatment is surgery. A, uh, but because surgery is invasive and uh, do require general anesthesia, some patients don't wish to have surgery. And that's why we consider femoral ablation. And femoral ablation has been, has been having an important impact in, in the medical field in terms of treating thyroid nodules. And it's considered not only an alternative, but also as a treatment of choice in a number of centers ar around the world. And there are different types of non-surgical treatment for thyroid nodules. Uh, on, up on the list, the first one is the high-intensity focus ultrasound. This is probably the, the only non-needle-based ablation. So in other words, you don't need to insert a needle into the nodule to cause a shrinkage of the, of the nodule. Whereas other needle-based ablations, such as radio frequency, laser ablation, microwave ablation, and ethanol ablation, they all require needle-based ablation. And so the, the major benefit of using high-intensity focus ultrasound is the fact that you don't need to insert a needle. And that could be important in patients who are on, a, on, a, on some sort of anticoagulation or antiplatelet agents. So what are the benefits uh, of non-surgical treatment over surgery? Well, first of all, it is non-invasive. Uh, you don't need to make an incision in the neck. And the other benefit is it is effective in, in shrinking the nodule and relieving local symptoms. It is also a safe and tolerable outpatient procedure. So, so surgery, most patients need to stay for one or two nights in the hospital, whereas for high-intensity focused ultrasound treatment. Um, it can be done as an outpatient. They only spend uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, uh, in, in the treatment uh, room, and then they go home uh, a few hours after the treatment. And it is also preserving the organ function because the nodule is actually inside the thyroid. We're not actually, we, we're not actually damaging the surrounding organ function. While, while surgery, it's about removing at least half of the thyroid, and so you will lose half of the, the function. Uh, there's no general anesthesia, as I already said. Um, it is relatively inexpensive as compared to surgery, and there's no really advanced technology required. So, I mean, experimental uh, 
data have really shown that you know high food can induce tissue necrosis, as, as seen from these pictures there. In terms of selection, uh, uh, it is it is useful for patients who have symptoms or have a large size uh, nodule, or if, if the nodule is growing in size over time. Um, before treatment, we, we need to make sure the nodule is benign. Uh, so, sonographically and also cytologically. And normally we treat solid or predominantly solid nodules. And the patient should have normal fire function. This is the picture of the actual device that we use. This is uh, basically has several components. It has a balloon that is uh, in contact with the skin. That is, has a, the balloon is filled with fluid to cool the skin. While inside the, the treatment head, you could see there is a image, imaging probe for you to direct the, your beam to the, to the center of the nodule. And then you have the treatment probe, which actually uh, propagate the waves, uh, focus wave into the nodule, generating about 65 to 85 degree um, in heat, uh, centigrade of heat inside the nodule. And with that, the nodule would, would shrink over time. Uh, the principle of high intensity focal ultrasound is already, I'm sure of you are already uh, un, un, understood. Basically, it's uh, the good advantage of this is that um, this can be done through the skin without, without causing, uh, without needing a puncture of the skin. Um, there have been, a lot of different organs being treated with high intensity focal ultrasound, including prostate, breast, breast cancer, various brain conditions, and now thyroid nodules. Um, so basically, the dish, uh, the 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 uh, criteria I told you already. The other thing probably important would be the location of the nodule. So the treatment depth is important. If the nodule is too close to the skin, then it can cause skin burn. While it is too deep to the skin, the energy can dissipate uh, by the tissue in front. So it's important to have a good selection. In terms of pre preparing the patient for treatment, we usually recommend patients to be fasted overnight. Uh, during the treatment, the patient should be in supine position with a neck slightly extended, we normally would give a dose or two of sedation to make the patient more comfortable for the treatment. Uh, before the treatment, we give we, we, we usually do an ultrasound examination of the thyroid to look for the the treatment nodule as the treated nodule as well as the non non-treated non nodules. We normally would, would infiltrate the area with some local anesthesia. Uh, sometimes hydrodissection is done and the planning of the nodules is important. Normally we do single, sometimes for larger ones we do sequential. And after the treatment, we usually will apply ice pack. So I'll show you a video later on of how this is done. This is just a picture of what hydrodissection is. Basically you could see here is the, uh, during the treatment, uh, before the treatment, we inject some fluid uh, uh, below or in, uh, behind the nodule to try to push the nodule away from the heat sensitive structures such as the common carotid artery and the vagus nerve. Uh, the needle is placed in the perithyroidal area where we, we would inject local anesthesia to, in, to, to help with the tolerance of the treatment. Uh, this is again just a picture showing you the actual treatment head with the, with the imaging probe with the treatment transducer as well as the skin cooling membrane. Uh, this is uh, the video. It, it's roughly this is a demonstration for thyroid nodule high food treatment. Patient lays down on treatment bed and keeps her neck hyperextended. Inject intravenous sedation. Pre-treatment scan with ultrasound machine to locate thyroid nodules.
Adjust the treatment head onto patient's neck. Adjust the laser beam onto patient's neck. Outline skin and thyroid nodules on touchscreen. So you could see at the top there, that's the skin, uh, followed by some muscles and then the nodule. At the bottom there, you could see the pulsating, that's the common carotid uh, artery. Uh, there are two screens. One is actual planning, the other one is the real, real time image of the actual treatment. Uh, actual um, nodule. The Confirm the target area. Basically, the, the machine will automatically divide the nodules into small subunits. Observe the echogenicity change of the treated site. So the machine will give an eight, eight second treatment pulse. And after the, the second the pulse, you could see the area has been ablated. Uh, this, you can see the micro bubbles within the nodules. You know that you have heated up enough of the nodule. Um, the circles in the center, basically the, the green centers are the treated uh, area. Uh, the un, uncolored uh, circles are the untreated area. So the machine will keep going until they all turn green. Post-treatment scan with ultrasound machine. Observe vocal cord. You could see both cords are moving. And then the nodules is filled with micro bubbles and you know you have You've done a good ablation on this nodule. Discharge patient to recovery room. Apply pack onto patient's neck. So in, in, this is the typical picture of what you get uh, after the ablation. On the left side there is the pre-ablation followed by post-ablation and uh, four days after ablation. You can see the nodules, uh, the size hasn't shrunken that much initially in the first four days, but you can see the color of the nodules has become more hyperchoic. For larger nodules, we would normally do uh, two treatment uh, on the same nodule because it, the, uh, each of the, the treatment head at the moment can only treat about 3 to 4 cm nodule. If it is anything bigger than 4.5, then you need uh, two treatment. Um, this is some examples of, uh, of what we call sequential treatment for, for large nodules. Uh, Pre-abrasion immediately after first treatment and immediately after second of second treatment. You could see after the second treatment there were more hyperchoic marks. Uh, this is a uh, typical uh, pictures of the treatment uh, room we have. Basically the machine is placed at the head of the patient. Um, the, uh, the single bed, uh, the patient come in uh, in the morning, have the treatment, then they go home uh, in the afternoon around two to three o'clock. Um, this is a picture, typical picture of someone having the treatment. Um, I think I spoke already before, uh, depends on the location of the nodule. Sometimes if it's too close to skin, it makes it very difficult because the machine automatically shut down the amount of energy uh, for the treatment. 
while, while for deeper nodule, it can also be a problem. So there's a kind of a Goldilocks uh, area that you can treat this kind of nodule with high food. Uh, this is another video. Um, and after treatment, uh, this is a typical picture of someone who, who immediately after the treatment, you could see some redness on the side of the treatment. This is not because of any kind of burn. In fact, it's due to cooling of the balloon, causing vasodilation of the, of the papyrus on the skin. How, how do you know you have done a, a good ablation? Well, we can check that biochemically by by uh, measuring fire goblin uh, both before treatment and four days after treatment. And we can see almost everyone will have a raised uh, fire goblin afterwards. Um, apart from biochemical changes, you sh uh, uh, on ultrasound, you could see that the nodules become more hypochoic, become smaller. You could see uh, about a week uh, after the treatment, the volume of the nodule has shrunken by about 10%. By about three months, we usually would get a 50% uh, shrinkage, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, uh, apart from the color that you see here, the other thing that we observe is cavitation. So a solid nodule will become more cavity, more cavity within the, the lesion. By seeing that, you know that uh, the ablation is, is working. For you. And this is a picture of a patient uh, with a basal file goblin of 45, and day four is up to about 2,000. Uh, this is some good, uh, treat, good successful treatment. Uh, someone with a ablation of a, almost an 87% uh, volume reduction in, in nodule. With that kind of volume reduction, you expect the patients to have uh, much improved uh, symptoms in terms of uh, local and also pressure symptoms. Uh, for moderately sized nodule, so slightly bigger nodule, they do shrink, but they don't shrink as much. In this patient, we, uh, we, we got a 75% uh, volume reduction with one treatment after six months. So pretty, pr pretty good. For patients with con conglomerated or multiple nodules, uh, they are more difficult to treat regardless of what you do. Uh, we also treat them and we do get uh, reasonable results. Sometimes with uh, nodules with calcification, this can also be treated this way. Uh, for, this, for this patient, you could see the nodule uh, shrink uh, over, over time. Because somehow the, the calcification is not complete and so the, uh, the high intensity focus ultrasound can get can penetrate through the calcium into the nodule and causing a shrinkage. Uh, this is a picture of a nodule with an intranodular macro calcification. These kind of nodule can also be treated. Uh, you, can, you can focus your heat into the calcification and that causes a kind of a deflection and that causing, causing a, a wider area of ablation. So this is a, just a picture showing you that. So overall, you could see there's a 60% reduction as compared to someone who have no treatment. So, so that's the reason why we would recommend high intensity focus ultrasound for symptomatic uh, thyroid benign thyroid nodules. Uh, some longer longer term data. This is published uh, almost four years ago now. Basically. The two years of efficacy is up to about 70%. Uh, but you do, you do have about 20% you know, of nodule, which can increase a little bit in size uh, over this, this period. So, so you should observe uh, patients with nodules uh, after treatment uh, for as long as possible.
Uh, what are some of the potential shortcomings um, as compared to other types of ablation? Probably uh, for at the moment, the, the, treat, the machine actually um, takes longer to treat nodules. The average uh, treatment time is about 40 minutes. Whereas for other needle-based uh, ablation, it may take 20 or 30 minutes. So almost uh, a 50% increase in, in treatment time. And uh, it's not all, sh all nodule shrinks, only about 8% do, and about 20% don't. And there are some potential complications that we should be aware of. Uh, skin burn is one of them, that we had uh, two patients with skin burn. We had a, a num uh, about, about four or five patients with recurrent nodule nerve injury. The Horner's syndrome, we have one patient, incomplete treatment and so on. So these are some of the complications that we need to be aware of. Uh, if you compare other needle ablation, you could see the treatment time is, is, is shorter. And there are more cases, more experience worldwide for, for needle-based ablation than no needle-based, such as high food. Um, but hopefully this will change uh, uh, with time. Uh, there are some, some successful uh, treatment cases. So for example, this, this patient, uh, basically, the, page, uh, the nodules did not shrink enough, only about 10%. So uh, in that situation, we might consider treating again. Sometimes we don't get a complete ablation. Uh, this is an example. You could see, for example, in the middle, you could see the nodule has only some areas of hypo, hypoechoic areas rather than the whole nodule. So you know that the nodule is not completely ablated. Uh, again, this is another example of, uh, of an unsatisfactory response. Uh, another nodule, uh, close to skin, very difficult to treat. In that situation, probably a needle-based uh, treatment would be better than high-intensity focus, focus ultrasound. Um, we, we, we do have patients who had one treatment had shrinkage, for example, this patient, and then after a year, the patient wanted another treatment, and so the nodule keeps shrinking with multiple uh, treatment. Um, this really, did, you need to discuss this with the patient because uh, some patients are not so motivated for this. Uh, for this patient, uh, she had a very good outcome. The eventual shrinkage was over 75%. So uh, one of the things you should be aware of is scars uh, when you treat this because the wave uh, acting on the scar can cause pigmentation. And also this is a patient who had Horner syndrome. The patient has improvement in the ptosis of the eye after six weeks, but nevertheless, it was an unexpected outcome that, that, we, that the patient uh, eventually she recovered. So the benefits are it's non-invasive. There's no need to withhold any anticoagulation because it's not needle-based. It's scarless, it's organ and function preserving, it's outpatient, and you can avoid anesthesia. The disadvantage is that the machine costs money, it takes relatively long period uh, treatment time, and there's a learning curve. Uh, the more you do it, the better you, you get. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, what, we, what we found is that ultrasound-guided high-intensity focused ultrasound is an effective and safe treatment for benign viral nodules. A session of high-intensity focused ultrasound ablation can induce significant nodule shrinkage and improve nodule-related symptoms for the patient. Other ablation technique may be preferred over HIFU because of the fact that it, uh, HIFU actually takes longer. And so if you have multiple nodules, that can pose uh, much longer time for the patient. So with that, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I, uh, I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. Hi, Dr. Lang, thank you for, for, for joining us. Uh, no problem. Um, I would encourage no, no, anyone- Nice to be here. Oh, yeah. Um, I would encourage anyone with questions to please come up to the microphone. It looks like we've got one, one person coming up, so. Thank you for the talk. Um, a nice overview. Maybe I missed it, but 
I think you said your focal zone length was about five or seven millimeters long. How do you treat the entire depth of the nodule with this small focal zone? So the number of uh, strategies you can do that. Well, first of all, even though they say it's seven, seven or nine mm, actually you do get a, a bigger ablation. So you get some prefocal heating and also postfocal heating. So actually the depth is probably about 1.5 to 2 cm. Um, um, after, um, and that's the reason why for very thick nodule, we tend to do, do it twice, do sequential treatment. Uh, you could see the, uh, the extent of ablation by looking at the ultrasound. You could see the hypochoic areas and you know which, uh, which part you haven't, be, you haven't treated and you want to go back and treat and, uh, and so on. So even though they, they do say 7 mm or 9 mm, the, the actual ablation that you do see is, is more than that actually because you know the, you, do, do, you do get some heating uh, both above the focal uh, point and also up below the focal point, if you know what, what I'm saying. All right, Dr. Frank. Very nice talk. Um, I have several questions. So the, how well do you work with your endocrinologist in sort of uh, basically advocating for this pr approach when the patient does come to see you? Do you lay out the fact that they could have a needle, you know, a basically RF ablation, cryoablation, or surgery, or, or this approach? And how do they make, how do you work with them to make that decision to, say, get high food versus, say, an RF ablation approach? And lastly, the long-term durability, you sort of addressed a little bit about that and whether or not there's current. How many of these patients ultimately have to go to surgery, potentially, to be able to remove the nodule? Okay, uh, so uh, we work with our endocrinologists quite closely. So uh, essentially, they, the patient will be seen both by the endocrinologist and us. And uh, if there, if uh, only only patients who are who are candidates for surgery but don't want surgery would get ablation. Uh, it's a good question whether you should do high full or radio frequency ablation. Um, we do think uh, some nodules may be more suitable for radio frequency ablation, and some some are for uh, high food. For example, if the nodules are closer to the skin, I think high food would be less suitable because of the fact that you cannot treat uh, those nodules closer to the skin, uh, as well as nodules which are very deep, uh, very deep, something with very thick neck, then that will be difficult too. So it. It's kind of a selection. I think part of the learning process is select the right patient for the right procedure. And we're lucky at Queen Mary, we actually have, uh, we have radio frequency and also high, high intensity focus ultrasound to choose from. Uh, but of course, uh, for, you know, for, rect for large rect rectro rectrosternal nodules, then we would tend to recommend surgery because they're generally more difficult to uh, to a blade with thermal ablation. But yes, we do, so the short answer is yes, we do, we do, we do uh, see patients with our endocrinologists. In fact, a lot of these patients are referred from the endocrinologists to us. That's perfect. And, and we would usually would uh, offer surgery, and if the patient want to, don't want surgery because they either want to preserve their organ or they, they worry about scar and so on, then we will offer this kind of minimal invasive uh, procedure. Thank you. I mean, that's exactly what you want to have, is you want to have a buy-in from your endocrinologist with the, with the high food group and to be able to basically talk about the, all the different options to the patient and let the pa work with the patient have to decide. Absolutely. And in fact, we, uh, we actually do welcome them to, to come to the treatment so they understand uh, what, what exactly we're doing and so on. So we actually work very closely with them. Thank you so much. I, I just have one final question, and then I know we do have to wrap it up, but um, are there any ultrasound characteristics that you've identified on the, the, the pre-treatment ultrasound or, or, or other ultrasounds that predict non-responders? I mean, it looked like the ones that were non-responders tend to have 
a denser um, sort of makeup of their nodule? I think you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, uh, it is a well-documented uh, fact. It's if you see microcystic nodules, so those are spongy form type, like a sponge, and they tend to do better. Regardless, uh, they tend to do better with thermoablation uh, for high fluid as well as for radio frequency. Uh, for more vascular nodules, they are more difficult to, uh, to ablate, regardless of which mode of uh, thermoablation you, cho you choose. So yes, um, by, uh, by looking at the pre-ablation ultrasound, you know who are, who, who are going to do better, who are not going to do so well. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much again for joining us. Round of okay. applause for Dr. Lang. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.